It's Monday, it's noon, it's the Birmingham Tip-Off Club, and it is March Madness. This is the most religious time of the year for me, not just because it's Lent, but because this is a time of redemption. You can come back in basketball. That's one of the great things about it. You can come back. Yesterday, we saw Southeast Missouri State, 16-17 record, but they're going dancing. Tonight, South Alabama had kind of an up and down year, but they're one game away from going to the dance, playing against Louisiana Raging Cajuns. So this is the time when it's a time of new beginning, rebirth, your second chance, possibly your third chance, depending on your conference schedule. So welcome to the tip-off club. We got a great, a great program today. We got a lot of stuff coming up. We've had a lot of stuff happening in basketball. I, I've loved the uh, uh, TV news reports about, well, here's basketball in Birmingham. Is this, well, yeah, for some of them, yes, it is their first go around, some new reporters. But those of us who are looking at our sheets on the table about our history of host of the NCAA tournament know that this is a long and storied history. And it is so good to have the tournament back. I know last year during the final four, they said, here's the website where you can sign up for tickets for the regionals. And before the echo in the room had ended of that commercial, I had signed up for the notice to get that. And the first day it came on, I tried, then my son successfully bought the tickets online. Uh, it's very good to have a young person around you as IT department. So this is coming up. It's right here coming. It is a wonderful time of year. Our head table today is myself, Kevin Skarbinski, Dick Coffey, David Gilball, Jeremy Hammond, and Preston Kirk. And we're going to have a wonderful panel discussion. Uh, I'd like to now call Philip Corley up, who will be doing the prayer and the invocation. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and for your many blessings. We praise you for your creation and for your love for us. Please forgive us for our sins and help us to put you first and treat others the way we want to be treated. During this season where we celebrate basketball, please help us to be mindful of people who are hurting and suffering. Move us to action that we would comfort and serve those in need. We thank you for your love and for your endless mercy. Lord, we know that it's a little silly to pray for shots to go in or to not go in and for our teams to win, but we confess that we're going to do it anyway. We pray that you will keep the players and the participants safe and give them success, not only in their games, but in their lives afterwards. We pray for a great tournament, for buzzer beaters, for good officiating, exciting upsets, and great competition. Thank you for our speakers and for this club. We ask that you would bless this food to our bodies and us to your service. Amen. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. One of the cool things about introducing people and getting the meeting started, I get to look down and see uh, who the basketball winners and losers are. And uh, I'm not saying anything, but I don't have anything to worry about today. So that's good. Uh, our MC, what more can you say about Kevin Skarbinski other than he's our MC? He's also one of the great writers in this town, one of the, 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 the wonderful people who over the years has supported and encouraged basketball. And uh, there's a lot of things I, I, I listen to him about and basketball is one of them. I give you our eminent MC, Kevin Skarbinski. Thank you, Scotty. Where's... 
coach, if I played for you, I'd be running steps constantly for being a little bit late for meetings, hopefully not for games. Um, first of all, I want to say how excited I was to see so many of you at Legacy Arena last week doing so many different things to make that event successful. And if you know, and especially thank you to those of you who kept me supplied with popcorn uh, the last three days. I don't know what I would have done without you. So if you were there, you know, um, Saturday was a very big day at Legacy Arena. Everywhere you looked, someone was making history. The Pleasant Grove girls, they won the first state championship in school history. The Valley boys became the first 5A team, 5A boys team in state history to go undefeated and complete a championship season. And then the Hazel Green girls, they did something that no girls or boys program in Alabama has ever done. They won their sixth straight state championship. Just amazing. Kudos to Coach Tim Miller and the Trojans. And then the Hoover boys and girls, they swept the 7A titles. And since the state added that seventh classification, no one had ever done that. More history. So congratulations to everyone. There were so many great players. You're going to meet one of them uh, shortly who stepped up and showed out last week at Legacy Arena. So we saw plenty of history. We also saw the future. His name is Caleb Holt. He plays for the Buckhorn Bucks. I don't usually make these kind of predictions, but I'm just going to say, I'm not making a prediction, but I'm going to say, don't be surprised if one day he plays for the Milwaukee Bucks or against them. He's that good. All he did Saturday in the 6A championship game was score 32 points <clears throat> and grab 18 rebounds. And he had four assists as Buckhorn beat Mountain Brook for its first state championship since 1995 in the 6A championship game. This was after he went for 33 points and 14 rebounds with five steals in the semifinals against McGill Tulin. McGill Tulin's coach, Philip Murphy, said he's going to be a pro one day. Mountain Brook coach Tyler Davis called what Caleb did on Saturday a LeBron James, Michael Jordan performance. Did I mention that Caleb is a freshman? He just turned 15 years old. Just turned 15 years old. He's uh, 6'5", about 190. He might not be done growing. Uh, it made me think of, you guys remember, LeBron's first big advertising campaign for Nike. We are all witnesses. If you were there in the last week at Legacy Arena with me, we are all witnesses to the beginning of what could be a very, very special career. Oh, and uh, just in case you were wondering, Alabama, Auburn, and UAB all offered Caleb a scholarship last April before he ever played a high school game at this level, certainly at the Final Four level. So, again, congratulations to Caleb and Buckhorn, to Spain Park, Coach Latch, and the young man you're going to meet shortly. Again, the way that every – from start to finish, and I was only able to be there Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, but what we witnessed – was high-level high school basketball. A seventh grader from Mars Hill, Bell Hill. Seventh grader. You think Caleb's young. A seventh grader, Bell Hill, scored 27 points in the championship game to win the MVP. I don't know what you were doing in seventh grade. I was playing, it, I was playing for the St. Patrick's Catholic Youth Organization team in Pottsville, Pennsylvania against other seventh graders. I was not competing in a state championship. So the reason that that happens is because of people like you, because of the work you do, the spotlight you put on basketball in this state. 
because that final four is here in Birmingham at Legacy Arena and has been since 1994. And that doesn't happen without you working behind the scenes as team hosts, as hospitality, room workers, and the million and one things that you do. So my hat is off to you for everything you've done through the years to elevate basketball in this state. Give yourself a hand, round of applause. All right. Let's go to the highlights. Direct your attention to this week on the Birmingham Tip-Off Club, it's conference tournament week across the nation, but in Alabama high school hoops, we already crowned some champions. Mountain Brook looking to host a blue map. They play top recruit Caleb Holt and Buckhorn top, but the Bucks just too good. The Spartans fall 65 to 56. In 7A, the Hoover's boys and girls both playing for a state title and both deliver. The boys wallop Central 84 to 66. For the girls, it's their third straight blue map. Congrats to Hoover. The college hoops now entering the last week of the regular season. Alabama still sitting at number two in the nation. Tennessee, Kentucky, and Texas A&M joining the tide from the SEC in the top 25. Alabama finishing up the final week at home against Auburn to start the week. Under a minute left, Auburn down two. In transition, Wendell Green Jr. finds a cutting Allen Flanagan for the layup. Game tied at 75. In overtime, Crimson tied up two. Mark Sears hits the three. Alabama up five. And later in OT, Crimson tied up two. Jaden Bradley drives, finishes with a tough reverse layup, plus the foul. Alabama goes on to win 90 to 85. Crimson Tide clinched the SEC regular season title. Now it's on to the SEC tournament for the Tide and Tigers. Alabama is obviously the top seed. They won't play until Friday. Auburn is a seventh seed. They play 10 seed Arkansas on Thursday. To the SOCON tournament, two seed Sanford against seven seed Chattanooga. Jamal Johnson led Chattanooga with 25 points and secured the victory with a three pointer with 39 seconds remaining. Heartbreak loss for the Bulldogs in the quarterfinals to end their season. A heck of a year for Bucky McMillan and company. Sanford finishes 21 and 11. UAB still has hope for an NCAA tournament berth. They beat Charlotte in double OT Saturday, led by this man, Jelly Walker, with a monster game. 41 points, six assists, four rebounds. Up next for the Blazers, the Conference USA Tournament as a three seed. They will play on Thursday against the winner of Rice in UTSA. <laughs> yeah, a lot of guys want a lot of bricks. Some of them have built barbecue pits in the backyard to put it to good use. Uh, the Ivy League has their conference tournament coming up, and they've got eight teams in the conference. Four of them will not be there. They only selected four teams, two-day tournament, semifinal and final. And I'm just wondering, how did the four teams that played all year don't get to go to the conference championship? I was sitting here with JT and Devin uh, from the state. We were talking about high school basketball. Starts with area of play with all the teams, advances to regional, then gets to the uh, Birmingham here, talking about how some kids remark I've never been to Birmingham. I get to come. And I just, uh, I hope that's not a trend that's going on among the conferences, not to let all teams play in the conference tournament. Because as JT says, you can get hot and advance all the way, or you can get cold and you're out immediately. 
but that applies to all teams. Coach is shaking his head, yes. Uh, example, Kentucky's women's team won two games in the conference. Their record was like two and 12. They won two games, it was all. Conference tournament, they won two games and almost made it to the semifinal. So what I look at is to the kids, you never forget playing. If you came to the state here, you'll never forget that. Sam, you, you've had experience. You know what it is. You'll always remember that. You'll always have friends that you played with. So I, I, I hope that's not a trend that's going. There's a couple of other conferences have done that. So that's my comment for the day. And as you've heard here, um, how important it is to have all involved. All right. I'm, I get the cho uh, responsibility of awarding a basketball and a brick to the winners and losers of our pick sheets this week. We had uh, some extra games this week, but didn't seem to help. But anyway, our bottom three brick winner, uh, number three, Jim Turnipseed, and our friend. 41%, but you're not the loser. William Galloway, 41%. William, you're not the loser. The loser is James Sasser, 35%. <laughs> so we have our brick with the Birmingham Tip Off Club on it. Congratulations, James. All right. And our winners. Uh, Third from top, Dick Coffey, 64%. Hubert Marson, 64%. But the winner is Clayton Bromberg. Clayton, is he here? He's not here. Now we go down to Hubert Marson. Hubert, tell you what, I'm going to get our speakers today to autograph the ball, and you can come pick it up when the uh, session's over. Okay. Uh, Nothing funny, but I just wanted to make a little comment today. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That's the great thing about basketball. If they expand the tournament, get more teams in, there would be another game. You got a chance. High school, in this state, college, generally, to play in your area. If you're in high school, to play in your conference tournament, to play in college. You have a chance to win a championship. So, if you, if you say that basketball is the most democratic of sports, unlike that sport with that odd baseball. And now, to introduce our player of the week, Dick Coffee. Thank you, Kevin. Our player of the week this week is Sam Wright from Spain Park High School. Uh, before we get to Sam, though, I want to make sure and introduce his coach to you, uh, Chris Latch, if you'd wave right down here in the middle. Uh, Chris. Uh, <laughs> Chris is a familiar face to many of you. He's been a head coach in the greater Birmingham area 29 years, uh, long run at Briarwood, was the first coach at Helena, and uh, has now been at Spain Park for five years and has been to the final four, three consecutive years. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, coach was our coach of the year, the Birmingham Tip-Off Club coach of the year in 17-18, 2017-18 season. And uh, coach, if my math is right, I think you're getting close to 500 wins. He's modest, he wouldn't give me a number, but, but um, it looks like next year, no pressure, but I think he's got a good chance to, to hit that mark next year, which is really amazing because he's a young guy still. Uh, so coach, great to have you with us. Uh, I'd like to invite Sam Wright up, to, uh, up here. Sam is a 6'9 center forward. At Spain Park, he averaged this year 17 points, eight rebounds a game. He was the MVP of the Northeast Regional, uh, bringing his team back to the Final Four for the third straight year. Uh, he was at the Final Four selected for the all-tournament team. Uh, he's going to represent the state next week or 10 days from now in the Alabama-Mississippi All-Star Game, which is a tremendous honor. Um, he has offers right now from the United States Naval Academy from Dartmouth, and uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of buzz going on, a lot more folks calling him and talking to him, but, uh, if, and, you, and you may ask why are those 
prestigious universities coming all the way down to Alabama. And uh, of course his ba basketball talent is the main thing, but uh, he's got a GPA of 4.45. <laughs> so uh, let's welcome Sam Wright. Um, I want to uh, thank everyone here um, that was part of this and invited me to this and um, was part of this, giving me this award. Um, thank Coach Latch, obviously, and the Spain Park uh, other coaches on the staff um, and my parents for helping me along the way to reach my potential. Um, and yeah, thank y'all. Good job. Congratulations, Sam. We'll be watching. I had the privilege of being the host of the last three days uh, there at Legacy Arena. You know how Sam stepped up time and again and how that game between Spain Park and Central Phoenix City may have been the game of the tournament. It was, it literally went down to the last shot. And that last shot, that it, from my vantage point, it was about that much off of going in and sending us to overtime. Let me also say, and I hope everyone, there are handouts at the table out front that I hope you had a chance to pick up. Just some research I've done over the years about the NCAA tournament in Birmingham. And just a couple of highlights. It's been here 10 times, the men's tournament. That's just the men's. And of all the SEC state foot, all the states in the SEC footprint, any state in the Deep South, no city that has not hosted a Final Four has played host to the NCAA men's tournament more than Birmingham, Alabama. And you have contributed to that, and these gentlemen certainly have contributed to that, and they will continue that tradition in a week or so when we all reconvene at Legacy Arena for the first and second rounds of the NCAA tournament. So let's introduce our panelists. Uh, let's see, let me get my, get my stuff together here, guys. First of all, to my right, Jeremy Hammond. Jeremy is the SEC Assistant Commissioner for Championships. He over, oversees and manages all aspects of the SEC football championship game, the SEC softball tournament. You talk about high level play. SEC softball is as good as it gets. And obviously, he, you have, he has, as all these gentlemen do, they have vast experience in event management and coordination. And Jeremy, if I'm correct, you are an Ohio State grad, correct? Ohio University. Ohio o University. O oh. OU Bobcats. Oh. Well, I, I think I would speak for every Alabama fan in the state. They appreciate your contribution to this Alabama season <laughs> by uh, allowing Mark Sears to come and play an integral role for the Crimson Tide this season. So Jeremy, thank you for being with us. Yes, sir. Our next panelist, David Galbaugh, is no stranger, I, I think, to anyone in this room. Longtime member, uh, officer, executive at the Greater Birmingham Convention and Visitors Bureau. We could be here all day talking about all the events that you've been involved in, David. Most recently, and most notably, the World Games. So David, thank you so much uh, for being here. And, and David is a... A, not only an Auburn graduate, but a Barry High School graduate, correct? That's right. That's correct. Yeah. So Some of us still remember Barry High School back uh, in the day. Yeah. Coach Finley was my football coach. So yeah, good memories. You had uh, a great tutor. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. For so sure. thanks for having me today. Thank you. And last but not least, Preston Kirk, <clears throat> the Vice President of Events for Knight Edie. We cannot thank Knight Edie enough for all they do for enhancing our sports landscape month in and month in, out, year in and year out. Uh, Preston is a, as a Birmingham native, he's an Alabama graduate, right? Right. Okay, so we've got a pretty good cross section uh, of representatives here. Uh, he's been, and he spent years as an integral part of the Birmingham Crossplex. About 30 NCAA championships <laughs> that you oversaw there. It felt like it, it was close, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but fortunate enough to be there for 10 years and, and do a lot of NCAA events there as well. So <clears throat> thanks for having me here as well. Well, let's, uh, these, these gentlemen were, again, instrumental 
in bringing the NCAA tournament back to Birmingham for the first time since 2008. Right. And so we want to get, we want to dive in a little bit into how this process works, uh, what's going to go on next week, what it took to get it here. So, so let's start, first of all, with uh, the bid package. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you guys, I'm, I'm not going to necessarily direct, I'm going to let you guys kind of jump in, whoever feels most uh, qualified to answer any particular questions. But what, what went into the bid package? What were the key elements of the package that was submitted to convince the NCAA to bring the event back here this year? I, I think I'll jump, jump in first and just back up a little bit. And, you know, I guess after the 2008 um, tournament, you know, we got feedback from the NCAA that, quite frankly, our facility wasn't up to, uh, to where we needed it to be to move forward with another bid. So, um, you know, quite frankly, without the renovation to Legacy Arena, I don't think we'd be here today and having this conversation. But, I mean, so started there, and then ultimately, I mean, we, uh, we got a great team together, and it really started with the SEC being our host. I mean, first and foremost, without the SEC, it doesn't work. And then certainly from the event management perspective, I mean, Preston and, and Night Edie, we couldn't have done it without those guys as well. So the team came together, and, you know, I guess that was back in, I think that was December of 19, I believe, is when we first started having the conversations. And then, you know, I, these guys can kind of speak to the bid portal and what that looks like and as far as the bid cycle for the NCAA. So. Yeah, what's interesting, you, the NCAA now wants you to bid on a four-year block. So you don't do just single-year bids. So this block we're in right now is 2023 through 2026. Uh, I believe that's our, our time frame right now. And then they will award out those four years. So it gives you a lot of time to plan your events. You're not just trying to plan it year to year to year and you don't know. So the next bid cycle would be for 27 through 30. Obviously, <laughs> we, we'll put in another round of bids. But yeah, it's, they, they give you the opportunity to see what's available to bid on. Um, obviously, March Madness is one of the big sports that every single city across the country wants to bid on because it brings in the most people. Uh, and obviously, the NCAA now realizes that their championships, whether it be Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, it's big money to that city. So being able to have the facility, I think it's important to note when, when this bid was put in, Legacy Arena was under renovation. So we put the bid in basically with just drawings. Um, there was really no, you know, and renderings, there was no, you know, it was, there was no pictures of it. There was no video, there was nothing. So for, for the incident of blade, you know, to trust that bid that we collectively put in is a big deal, knowing that they really didn't even know what the facility was going to look like that, that they were bringing here. So I think that's, that's important to note. And that goes to the, the historical data of Birmingham being a host and the fact that it's not just about the building itself, but trusting what is here that can that can collectively come together and lift up that event is it's a big deal to, to the NCAA also. So having those key factors, the CVB, the city, the 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 SEC, the conference all come together and be able to to put that is it's it's it was a, it's a lot. And we've been fortunate for a long time to have the SEC headquartered here. Jeremy, it is a grind though for the people at the SEC office. You had the women's tournament last week. You've, you've got the, the men's tournament this week in Nashville. You will have no, an untold number yet of men's and women's teams playing in each tournament across the country. So what goes into it from the SEC's perspective in deciding to say, yes, we will be the host institution? Sure, yeah. I think the, the big factor for us is Birmingham's been home for a long time. So anything that we can do to be a part of the equation to bring events like this to, to Birmingham uh, to benefit the city, uh, to provide an opportunity for folks to get involved, uh, to showcase all the great things that are here. I think that's that's first and foremost what's important to us um, is to make the you know a small be a small part of bringing that uh, to town here. Um, it's a big lift. Uh, obviously, you know we've we've needed to rely on on Preston and his team at Night to help us with this. You know, as you mentioned, going from our women's tournament in Greenville just wrapped up yesterday, and then many of our staff already headed to Nashville, and I'll be headed there tomorrow, uh, and then coming back and. Uh, we have our gymnastics championship in Duluth, Georgia, the same week that the NCAA tournament is. So I think that should, you know, picture for you all how important it is to us that even given all of that, all the stuff on our plate day to day, uh, we still want to be involved in, in hosting the NCAA tournament here because of the great people here and, you know, the role we can play in showcasing that. And I think maybe David and Preston may be able to speak to this and how competitive 
was the bid process. Do, do you know how exactly how many cities put in bids? Do you know what other cities specifically are putting in bids while you're working on yours? I mean, with the event, you know, there's there's a huge appetite for this event, as Preston already alluded to. But one thing that I do know is that overall, in terms of all the championships and then the, the events that you're bidding on in that bid cycle, I think they're you know basically 85 championships and events, and then I think they got 3,000 um, uh, you know bids that you know across again the landscape of both you know all three divisions. So um, that really just speaks to the competitiveness of it all. Yeah, yeah the NCAA really offers a symposium um, before about six months out before your bids are due. And uh, David and I have both been a couple of times. And it's funny, everybody's in this massive room, all the cities and the CVBs and the sports commissions that all, that all come here. They welcome everybody and you know, give this introduction. And they say, all right, if you are here to bid on March Madness, we're gonna, we're gonna go meet in this other room. Literally like 80% of the room gets up and, and goes into this other room. They're all there to bid on you know, March Madness, either first or second round or, or the regionals or the final four. So it's, it's funny seeing, you know, the majority of people there to, to, I don't know what the exact number is, but yeah, everybody wants basketball. It, do you actually just submit a, a bid package or is there a, a representative who speaks and can answer questions about the package? How exactly does that work? I've done it both ways. <laughs> yeah, there's a bid that we collectively put together um, that has the lodging information in it, that has facility information, that has conference information. It can be anywhere from, from you know, how much, depending on how much you want to put in it, 100 pages long. It's, yep. it's detailed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's budget information of how you're going to spend, and they want to they wanna know down to the dollar how you're going to spend it and what you're going to spend it on. Um, and then I've also been a part of other championships where they did ask you to come back and do an in-person presentation just to see you face-to-face, -face, talk to you, build a little bit more of a relationship with you. So um, they do it both ways. Do you bid specifically on first and second rounds or regionals, or do you say we are available for both? And what, are, what is the cutoff? Because I know a lot, of, a lot of us are interested you know, in our history in the 10 tournaments that have been here, five have been first and second rounds and five have been regionals. But it's been a while, 97 was the last regional that we had here. And I, I know we were told at the time in doing some reporting on my, uh, on my part, that we were, the, the arena just wasn't big enough for a regional, that they were moving, even then we're moving towards domes and, and sites that could host a final four. Yeah. Is that still the case? What's the cutoff there? And we'll, could, what would it take for us to get a regional back here in the future? Is that even feasible right now? It, it, they, the NCAA, when it comes to all their championships, they spec out everything. So based off your facility, you know, they, they want to know how many seats and the Final Four needs this many seats and they need this many suites and they need lodging and this number of hotels. Everything is spec'd out. Mm -hmm. So really, you got you to see what specs you meet when it comes to a lot of those, a lot of their championships across all three divisions, um, it, Jeremy, you might have a little more experience with. Yeah, yeah, I think just spec out as you as you mentioned, uh, there was the trend when the Final Four went to football stadiums and they switched the orientation of the court, and you were no longer in a basketball arena. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the uh, uh, sort of rotation for regionals at that point went to given those facilities an opportunity to host a similar event to prepare them for the eventuality that they'd host the final four. We've gotten through most of those now. Um, so that's where you see like Louisville, I think is a regional Kansas city is a regional this year. Um, so more arenas are getting uh, more traditional basketball arenas are getting opportunities to host regionals. Um, so uh, while it's not on the cards right now, it may be in the future, depending on how they, you know, shift their, their bid specs. And, and one thing that, that it, I don't want to get lost in the shuffle, though, is we are hosting the uh, women's uh, regional right. in 2025. So, again, the regional, David, that's, right. that's exactly right. So um, I think that's just important to note. Because, again, this is a fun historical fact. From 82 to 97, Birmingham hosted more regionals than anyone in the country except for the New Jersey Meadowlands. Think about that. We had five regionals from 82 to 97, and only the Meadowlands had more. And again, they call this a football state? Come on.
<laughs> Come on. Uh, just some other, some interesting, some things that I think a lot of us are interested in, and we're going to give uh, our audience a chance, of course, to answer some, ask some questions uh, of you gentlemen in, in a minute. But the court itself, I know this is this is something that people talk about. I, it, it's it's one of those little side lights of March Madness that people talk about the courts themselves and how they are homogenized and and they don't necessarily reflect the home city. First of all, does the NCA supply actually supply the court itself? They do, yeah, they do, yes. Part of, the, part of their goal, and I think this has changed, uh, it's probably been 10 years at least now, where you saw a consistency in what the courts looked like at all the uh, initial rounds of the tournament. It used to be you could inject some of the local flavor on the court, and you'd see a lot of the differences. Uh, but I think that's just the goal of them creating some consistency across the board in what the tournament looks like and probably coincided with their current TV deal with uh, Turner and CBS. Um, so, yeah, they, they provide the courts. They ship them to us. Um, you know, depending on what equipment you have, they'll send you uh, your, your um, scores table and your LED scores board and your baskets if you need new baskets. Uh, so they, they, they provide a lot uh, to help you in hosting that, that event. How much, uh, David, and obviously it, you spend every day trying to promote the greater Birmingham area to outside of the greater Birmingham right, area right. to people who run events. So is there a push-pull there? with the NCAA, because obviously we want the name, you want the name Birmingham out there right. as much as possible in terms of signage, uh, television time, television spots. How does that work? You must've been on a couple of emails I had with Preston <laughs> because yeah, I mean, um, and it's not just the court. I mean, it's really the whole look and the consistency across the board. I mean, from the time you, you know, you get in the city until the time you leave. I mean, they want it to be, um, you know, really uh, NCAA, um, you know, they really want it to, to show the showcase the NCAA and what that look is. So um, we, uh, you know, we're working on a visitor center or a visitor table and we can't even put, you know, the Birmingham, the Birmingham logo on that table. So it's a little frustrating, but at the same time, you know, look at big picture and what this event brings to our community. And so I think, you know, that's, uh, that's something we can, we can kind of stomach because it's just such a great event. We understand. And again, it's across the board. It's not just, you know, they're not just holding Birmingham down. They're doing it to every city. So yeah. is there, are there TV spots included though, in the package that you get? I know with certain events, you'll get a number of spots for, again, for, the, for in Birmingham. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of events, we do get that, that those kind of broadcast spots, but unfortunately we, we don't get it here. So not on this national stage with what, because most of those CBS, you know, that's all corporate related and the NCAA has all their corporate partners that have to get the times and the, the spot. So a little bit different with March Madness and how, how much they give you access to their media options. In a sense, I think a lot of people would say it's more prestigious to have a regional because you're one step from the final four and your winner is going to the final four. We've seen that here. We saw Villanova in 85 come out of the regional here. No one expected them to win the national championship. They beat Patrick Ewing and Georgetown in the final in Lexington and play almost the perfect game, shot 70%, I think, from the field. Uh, we had Arizona in 97 come out of here and surprise a lot of people with an incredible backcourt and, and win the national championship. But in terms of visibility, opportunity to have more people in town, staying in hotels, eating at restaurants, shopping at local uh, shopping centers, is it more advantageous to have the first and second rounds because you have eight teams, you have four games the first day, and then two games two days after that? You know, it doesn't, I look at it as a, as just a great event, no matter what rounds we have. I mean, to me, it's, it's the start of everyone's bracket. <laughs> I mean, everybody is tuned in for that, the, for those first day of games. And obviously ours will fall on Thursday. Um, whereas, you know, the first round games are split, you know, Thursday and Friday. So we will, we will kick off March Madness. Um, so everybody's tuned into that, you know, the excitement levels there. That's how I look at it is it's, we, we are starting it off. Um, so not being a regional doesn't really, you know, sway me one way or not. It's just exciting that it's back. It's here. There's eight teams coming here. Um, you know, we're going to have great teams that, that, you know, come to Birmingham. So I, to me that it's, it's great no matter what, I, that we're on the national spotlight. So I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, and still first and second round speaks to what you can do. I mean, we hadn't had, what, 2008, right? So um, just speaks to, to Birmingham and what kind of sports destination we are. And um, it's just another, um, you know, important part of our resume now. Now, Jeremy, everyone wants to know, now, you, especially because it's such a quick turnaround, you know, March, uh, Selection Sunday is Sunday <laughs> in, in the evening, and then on Thursday morning, two teams will be playing in Legacy Arena. Do you guys get any kind of a heads up on the bracket? Do you get any uh, <laughs> a quick start on it? And if you do, I want your cell phone number. <laughs> yeah, uh, unfortunately not. There's no, you know, we've all got our own wish list of who we hope is here. And, um, but unfortunately that would not be considered uh, in the slightest, but uh, you know, really as Selection Sunday's playing out, I think the, the shows at 5 p.m. Central on Sunday night, Preston and I and our staffs will be in a room a few of us are going to come back from Nashville from our men's tournament to get back and get settled uh, for, for the selection show. And the work's going to start right, right then and there. So Sunday evening, it's going to be getting on the phone, getting on conference calls with all the other host cities with the NCAA, uh, starting to contact our game officials, starting to contact uh, the schools that are going to be here. Um, and that work will continue furiously into the early morning hours of Monday. And next thing we know, the week's here and teams are getting here on Tuesday and the ball's rolling. Do you know the game times, at least? I know you don't know. I know television doesn't even announce the game times for some, usually on Monday, right? Maybe late Sunday night for the, for the first two days. But do you, even, do you know the slots of the game times? You don't even know that? No, so that show will come on at 5 p.m. local time uh, on CBS. And then basically after, once that show goes off, CBS will get in their room you know, their production room in New York or, you know, their offices and basically start assigning game times after that. Um, they'll look at the matchups. What, who's a marquee matchup? Who do we want to put in this primetime spot? Who do you want to? So they'll take it over after that. From what we've been told, it will probably take them between four to five hours. So it could be midnight that we're getting that notification of our game times, or it could be first thing Monday morning um, once CBS has had a chance to start assigning all those times out. As far as you mentioned, you have preferences, obviously. I think everyone would love to see Alabama here. And they, if I don't know that they'll be the number one overall seed. We had a panel of three of the members of the selection committee uh, a few weeks ago, and they told us that the number one overall seed gets its choice of which, well, they choose a regional, and then they will slot them in the first and second round site that is obviously closest to them and will bring the most fans. Do you, you have no input in that, though, in terms of, do you, do you even suggest, you know, we'd love to see SEC team. We'd love to see Conference USA team if it was, say, UAB. And, and there are parameters, obviously, for the selection committee. You don't want to give a home court advantage to a lower seed. So, but do you have any input in that? In, not at all. Who you'd like to uh, not at all. And I think, you know, the one thing that's a little bit different for us, you know, we're host, used to hosting our conference tournaments and championships throughout throughout the school year. Uh, but this is one situation where we have to be neutral. Uh, we're hosting on behalf of Birmingham and we want every team that every school that comes to Birmingham to have the same uh, experience. So it's, it's kind of a weird situation to be in, but uh, we're going to treat Alabama if they're here just the same as we're going to treat Murray State or whoever else is here. Um, uh, now, yeah, we'd love to see all of our SEC schools be successful and be able to do it in their backyard. but uh, it's not a situation where we we can provide any input into saying, uh, yeah, we'd love we'd love for you to slot Alabama here. I've got to ask you this, David. This yeah. you'd be the perfect person yeah. to answer, answer this one. I, have you has anyone seen the thirty for thirty on Jim Valvano and the nineteen eighty three NC State team that shocked the world, beating Fi Slam Jam in the finals? Uh, it's an, if you haven't seen it, it's well worth watching. But one of the things, and this is what's relevant for you for you guys. NC State that year, they got sent to Corvallis, Oregon. And in, in the documentary, they talk about the hotel that they were, they were put in. <laughs> and they thought that it, was, it looked like a place that you would charge by the hour, shall we say. And that Jim Valvano's hotel room actually had a mirror above the bed <laughs> in the shape of a heart to give you some idea. They were not pleased. Uh, in fact, one of the players went to ask another player to go for lunch. And the player said, uh, have you looked around? I'm not leaving this hotel room except to go to the arena and back. 
Obviously, that's not the case here. But in terms of choice, yeah. how do you slot teams into hotels? Is there a preference? Is there a seed preference? Is there, how does that work? Yeah, so I mean, I can speak to it. And these guys can as well, but the NCAA came into December and looked at, I mean, soup to nuts. I mean, what Birmingham was gonna, you know, really present in terms of the, uh, the first and second round. And, and we went around to all of our hotels, which, you know, we've got great hotel products. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> no one's gonna have the heart-shaped uh, glass over the bed. So um, <laughs> that's, that's the good news. But yeah, so, and then they ultimately ranked them and then they decide, you know, kind of where, where they wanna slot those teams in terms of what seed goes to what property. So, so the NCAA really does that. Correct. That's not something you provide the properties. Yeah, you and, and, the and, properties. and clearly you, your hotel properties need to be, you know, very similar in terms of what they offer. So um, and that there's pretty strict criteria there. So, yeah, they came in and again, they ranked the, the hotels, but we've got we've got good products. So we, we didn't have any issue there. You know, this is something and, and I want you guys to draw on your your experience in event management and operation. What's the most maybe pre-event, during an event, oh no moment that you've experienced where something comes up that you weren't expecting or some little detail had slipped through the cracks and you just said, oh no, <laughs> what do we do now? Any, uh, anything spring to mind? <laughs> um, yeah, we've had some issues where, talking about uh, hotel properties where you know, all of a sudden something's happened and we don't have the room block anymore. And, you know, we kind of have to scramble. But that's, you know, they've got to have some place to stay, right? And so we've had, you know, luckily we've been able to kind of, you know, get around those and, and find solutions. But that, yeah, if they can't, if they don't have a property to stay in, that, that's an issue. That's a real issue. And that's before the, you know, any competition started. So that's, that's sort of my, uh, you know, kind of pucker up moment right there. So, yeah, that's, that's a problem. Um, on the Division Two level, there are two uh, schools that are in Canada. Uh, I, can, I can't, don't ask me the, the names, I can't remember off the top of my head, but we were hosting a, one of the Division II uh, National Championships with the Crossplex. And obviously you play the Canadian National Anthem as part of those, those championships. Well, the day before somebody said, where's your Canadian flag? Um, we're like, what, why, why do, you know, <laughs> what are you talking about? So, um, we had to scramble a little bit to find a Canadian flag in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, there were not too many options uh, <laughs> around here. We found one and we put it up. It was not the biggest Canadian flag. Um, it was about the size of this table. Um, but yeah, that was a little bit of a, we made sure the next year that we had a Canadian flag that was the same size as, as our <laughs> American flag. Hey, I got what I could get, Preston. Sorry, man. You know, we got the flag. We searched right? all over yeah. the place for a, for a Canadian flag. But some will Fortunately, that will not be an issue yeah. next week. No. no. Jeremy, what about you? You have any uh, any Ooh. particular <laughs> memories along those lines? Well, a recent one, and this is not necessarily anybody's oversight or fault, but if you watched our room, our women's tournament this past week, we had a rain delay uh, during during the games on, on Saturday with uh, a roof leaking. So, I don't know that if that's going to trigger us doing a structural inspection to every uh, venue that we go to, but uh, you know, that's one just makes you think on your toes because anything can happen at any time. Um, you know, and that's in venue out of venue, you know, you've got right now, luckily for this event, we'll have police escorts for all of our, our teams to and from the venue. But, you know, uh, I've left a football game recently at one of our schools with the officials right off the field and gotten stopped by a train. Uh, with a truckload of frat boys right next to us. So that was a lot of fun. Um, so, yeah, any, anything can really happen at any time, which I think is a testament to what it really takes to pull off an event like this. It's not just what happens in the arena that Preston and his team is going to manage there uh, on the court uh, and for the fans that are in attendance or what David and his team from the city and the CVB are doing to coordinate the hotels and uh, the other amenities in town. That all has to work together hand in hand. Um, because we're talking about experiences for the student athletes, but also, you know, if you're like me and grew up loving, loving the sport and traveled and got to experience, you know, going to the tournament as a kid, that's, that's something that sticks with you forever. Obviously a rain delay is, is suboptimal, but, but it pales in comparison to a tornado happening outside the doors, as we saw during the 2008 SEC basketball tournament in the Georgia Dome. And yeah. again, thank the Lord that Michael Riley hit that shot for Alabama. 
to send that game into overtime and keep those people inside. That was, uh, that was divine intervention, no doubt. We want to give uh, all of you a chance to ask, Scotty. Absolutely. Any, any questions for our panelists? Bob. I'll, I'll take the first one. So for, for our basketball tournament right now, we're locked into Nashville uh, at least through 2028. Uh, so we'll be there for the foreseeable future. We think it's, you know, a great host city uh, for that event, but we're always looking at, you know, new opportunities and what's on the horizon as things have changed. As you know, college athletics is changing rapidly. So our approach to what we do needs to change as well and uh, adjust to that. So, you know, our mind's always open to, to what the future holds, but right now we're, we're locked into Nashville for foreseeable future. And economic impact. Yes. Conference tournament versus. Yeah, NBA. and we, you know, since we hadn't been on conference uh, championship in a while, I'm, I don't know exactly what those numbers look like, but I mean, I can tell you this with this event, you know, you're looking at 13.6 million estimated economic impact. So, I mean, it's significant for our community. Um, and we, we look forward to having everybody come in and spend lots of money in our hotels and restaurants and, um, and, and have a great time. I mean, that's what we really want to do is put, you know, our destination in front of everybody and, and, let them have just a really wonderful uh, time here in, in their time in Greater Birmingham. Bleed over into Hoover too. I know that mayor for sure. So yeah. Yes, sir. They do. They yes. Do. Yeah. And we'll find those out uh, late Sunday night as well. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't have any influence in that, in that regard, do you? We do not. Those are actually kept in envelopes. I mean, it, even, not even the teams know until an hour before the game. So it's pretty under, it's under lock and key. They don't even know who each other are until they get here. And we start wow. to coordinate some of the meetings. So interesting. Can we take one more? Yes, sir. Yeah, unfortunately, we still won't have the uh, all the uh, the property up and running. But um, and it was it was a little difficult because when we submitted our bid, we had you know both the atrium and the uh, the tower side in our bid. So um, you know, unfortunately, we just don't have that in our inventory now. But we've still got what we need to make this to make this work. And and just along those lines, David, there are eight fan bases that won't know till Sunday evening that they're coming to Birmingham. Right. How much of a challenge is that to try to meet that need? Yeah, I mean, the good news is we've got, you know, plenty of inventory uh, in terms of our hotel inventory. But yeah, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be scrambled and people, you know, they're going to going to have to dial up their or, or get on the uh, online and, you know, make those reservations quick. So, um, yeah, they'll have to pivot and move rapidly to get here. Absolutely. So, yeah. Anyway, can we take one more, Scotty? One more. If anyone has a one more question, Dick. I mean, I can only speak, you know, from, from the CBV perspective without, again, without the SEC and without what Jeremy and, and his team are doing, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in this situation. So kudos to them. All right. Well, Preston Kirk, David Gelbaugh, Jeremy Hammond, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for everything you've done to bring the tournament back. We wish you the best of luck. I'll, I'll echo the invitation. We wish you buzzer beaters and no controversial decisions and no rain inside Legacy <laughs> Arena right. next week. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
on behalf of the Alabama High School Athletic Association, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation today. Um, it's been a great experience, my, my first time being here at the Tip Off Club, and I appreciate the invitation. But I also want to take this time to thank you uh, for what you've done at our uh, last week. Uh, your, the volunteers are huge. You don't understand what it goes in. You do understand what it takes to, to put all this together, but you don't realize how much you help um, make the event what it is. I can speak as a coach, a former coach. I was there a few years ago. And the experience we've talked about several times today of what it means to these student athletes. And it is huge. I, you know, to see the looks on my kids' faces when we walk in that arena and everything that you do to make it happen um, is truly amazing. Um, and now I see it from another standpoint of really what it takes to put on an event like this. And without you, we could not do it. And thank you very much. Just to reiterate what Devin said, it is, I, I have um, had the uh, unfortunate opportunity to work events that didn't have uh, the number or the quality of volunteers needed to put on that event, uh, and that was not the case last week. We had what we needed, and we had the quality of people we needed, um, and I think that's a testament to the organization as itself, and so we just, we greatly appreciate that. Um, I told Jim earlier, I remember when the tournament first started, and for the record, he said he was the brains behind this thing getting here, so I don't know if that's true or not, um, but as a, as a student athlete, I uh, never had the opportunity to play in the Final Four, but I remember coming up here on a field trip, missing school to go watch basketball, which at the time was the greatest day ever, uh, and just the atmosphere and the excitement. Um, and you still see that same excitement on the kids' faces when they come into the arena. Um, if you weren't able to catch any games last week and you do want to see some good quality high school basketball, as mentioned earlier, the uh, Alabama versus Mississippi All-Star Game is going to be happening this Saturday at the um, – at the Mitchell Center, uh, the University of South Alabama's campus. Uh, that is, the girls are going to tip at 12, and the boys are going to tip at 2. A uh, chance to see uh, Sam in action again. Congratulations uh, also, Sam, on the award today. But again, just, just thank everyone in here so much for what you do. Um, uh, you don't get enough thank yous for it, but just the, the excitement and the smiles and even uh, there was a some tears during some of the videos being played, just the excitement those kids have for that experience. We, we just thank you so much for it. Thank you. Well, thank y'all for coming today. Do we have a preview of our next meeting? In the world. In the world. <laughs> and, and you can tell from the, the good program we've had, the work has been very good for us. In the world. All right, well, I appreciate y'all coming. Uh, time to crank up the, the make sure the remote batteries are fresh and be ready for some basketball. I know tonight it will be one sitting there, and it's tough for a blazer to say that when we cheer for South Alabama. So let, let's look forward to it. Have a great tournament. See y'all, and you have a nice program. Tonight.